an amazing uh, review of a case in the best interest of trying to identify whether any uh, concerns or mistakes were made. And, and Sean, you're probably familiar with you know, bringing in domestic violence um, resources within the department and taking a look at how well child welfare is working and understanding the impact of domestic violence in the situation and making sure that all of the resources are, are devoted to that particular case. Uh, we will move on to one of our last topics, but first we want to just give any of you a chance, anything opioid related that we didn't discuss that you oh wanted gosh. to talk about. Anything opioid related? I just, right. really <laughs> I just, just wanted to respond to, some, <laughs> to, to what was just said, that what we're talking about here, the local, state, and federal level, is this delicate balance between accountability and resources. And it's very hard to do one well without the other. And so there's never, there's never an excuse for, for a lack of accountability um, from, from the top on down. And there is almost no oversight and enforcement of federal child welfare law, almost none. Almost all states have failed to comply with federal standards. And no state has been sanctioned or penalized or actually had their money withheld. Mm -hmm. So who's, who, who's actually afraid of being punished? I'm not sure, because there hasn't been any threat of, actu of states actually not getting the money that, that um, that they're applying for. But on the other end, the federal government's not investing in, chi in child welfare. So the number of children that states get reimbursed for for the foster care expenses, every year it goes down because of arcane eligibility requirements and formulas. And so state child welfare systems are under increasing pressure and financial strain and being, being asked to spend more and more every year. The federal government is cutting back and also not enforcing their own standards. And so this, this balance is, is, is way out of kilter um, and needs to be corrected. The accountability factor is not there right now. The accountability factor is not there, but is actually very hard. I mean, th I don't know exactly how much Maine gets from the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, but it's, I'm certain, under $200,000 a year. Is that correct? I, I, it's I it's, to, it's yeah. de minimis. Yeah. Um, and the amount of work that's required of every state to be in compliance with CAPTA is not in proportion in any way to the money they're actually getting to do it. So it's no wonder that states are out of compliance with it, yet that's not an excuse when the governor signs a certification every year that says the state is in compliance with CAPTA in order to get the money. And, we, it, and the Sean statutory yeah. foundation in the law says the department is responsible within available resources to do this work. So if the resources aren't there, it sort of, in a way, lets them off the hook to tie child safety to the available resources. I think we, as a society, we are responsible for that. That law is passed by the people we send to Augusta, and they've put that little caveat in. We're going to do all these good things to protect children. Within available resources. Within available resources. It doesn't matter if you have an opiate epidemic that leads to lots of children coming into care, stretching resources. The commission and I were on a, on a debate several years ago where that was part of the discussion. Um, what, what do, where do you place your, you know, your resources? And when you have unexpected things happen, like an opiate ep epidemic, um, then less children are going to be kept safe um, because you've only got allocations of so much resource. Well, I, I just want to stress, though, again, within the child welfare uh, agency within the department, everyone comes to work dedicated mm -hmm. to protecting children. And there are um, significant supports that have been made available. We've increased uh, the salaries of child protective caseworkers to try to address that retention and recruitment challenge. But it is also about how do we make sure that the resources are targeted, that they are effective, that they're producing the best possible outcomes. And the issue about fear really isn't about the federal government. It's human nature to worry that what you've done was a mistake. And when you're talking about a child's life, that's what I'm talking about. Just as in healthcare, where a physician may feel he's made a mistake, but fear uh, coming forward. That's what we have to break down so that those concerns are escalated and that proper responses can be provided. Well, well, you're back to your question. If a parent has serious substance use disorder, we don't want to deter that parent from getting help by the fear of losing mm -hmm. custody of the child. We want to destigmatize that problem and offer as much help as we can, creating that difficult balance between protecting the child 
and getting help with it for the parent who needs help and wants help and, prevent, and preventing the child from being taken away from the family and further traumatizing that child. So we need to destigmatize it and offer treatment beds and substance and, and methadone and Suboxone, me medication assisted treatment whenever possible. Mm -hmm. We have to move forward with our next mm -hmm. uh, and final topic, I believe. So, um, do you want to take this? Yeah, sure. And if you guys have any notes that we didn't get to talk to, just write okay. them down and we'll, we'll circle back. At the end um, for final comment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we understand that these child abuse cases deserve some level of privacy, but obviously, as we mentioned, there are two ongoing murder trials in Maine right now Marissa Kennedy and Kendall Chick. Uh, both of them killed allegedly at the hands of their caretakers uh, and many of the circumstances are still confidential but these cases ushered in what could be potentially an overhaul of DHHS. Yeah, so in a moment we're actually going to speak with all of you about the ripple effect of these murders but first we want to hear quickly from the grandfather of victim Marissa Kennedy. When the phone call came that Marissa was dead it was just I can't describe the the pain neighbor next door would call and say hey they're they're yelling again and there's some banging on the, the wall i assume that the arguing that was, that was going on at the condo between sharon and julia was just normal bickering between a couple if we had been notified that there was suspected child abuse we would have been up there immediately got her and brought her back down to new york I don't want a witch hunt. I don't want it down to, all right, Ms. Jones is the one that dropped the ball because she didn't go out and visit when she should have. Or, I'm not looking for that. I'm, I'm looking for the people to come together within DHHS and say, look, the ball was dropped. A child is dead. We need to change this, this, or this in order to, to prevent this from happening again. Now, as you heard Mr. Kennedy say, he doesn't want to witch hunt. He doesn't want to play the blame game. Miss Mills, I want to ask you, you know, you're one of a very select group of people who knows more of the details that happened in these cases. What would you say to Mr. Kennedy to let him know that that overhaul and that solution based approach is going to happen so that what happened to his granddaughter doesn't happen to another sure. main child? And you know that I can't comment on the facts of we the do. case. Uh, my office is prosecuting the case and there's no way I'm going to try make any effort to impair the right of fair trial of, of the defendants and, um, and we know and we've been assisting the uh, OPEGA uh, in developing its research and walking that fine line between federal protection, privacy protections for education records and the like and the state laws and federal laws regarding child protection and making sure that OPEGA has as much information as they can legally access to supply to the Government Oversight Committee to make appropriate and robust recommendations to the legislature as soon as appropriate. I think it's a terribly important issue for, for the public interest to be involved in, for the public to be involved in, but it also requires this balancing right now and some degree of patience. Right, and, and I, we're not I, asking I, you to give those yeah. details right now. We just want to yeah. know, you know, how can you assure him, since he might not even know what happened in this right. case, that we are doing what we can moving forward to make sure it doesn't happen to someone right. else? And, and I think if you listen to the deliberations of the Government Oversight Committee, that bipartisan committee, they are taking this extremely seriously. Nobody can listen to Mr. Kennedy. Nobody can even read the press reports about this case. Uh, without it tearing at your heartstrings. And everybody wants to come up with some answers, some solutions. They can't be the simple, easy ones because they are complex issues and they're going to be complex solutions. I have confidence in the OPEGA and the Government Oversight Committee and ultimately the Maine Legislature to do the right thing here and make sure that another Marissa Kennedy murder does not take place in our state. Mm. Ms. Mayhew, what would you say is the biggest strength and the biggest weakness in the child welfare system, especially since some of these cases could have been brought to light under your administration? Well, again, I, I have not been in that position for over a year, so I don't have any familiarity uh, specifically with these two cases. Um, but, you know, and I would echo much of what the Attorney General just said. Um, we have to have the kind of scrutiny that is occurring right now. The department is certainly conducting its own internal investigation. The Governmental Oversight Committee and OPEGA. Uh, OPEGA uh, has an incredible reputation of conducting a very thorough 
investigation, and that will inform. And then the question, and, and what will be important is, is the department acting on the recommendations? And this isn't limited, by the way. We, we're referring to the department, but this is a much broader system review. Uh, it involves law enforcement, it involves uh, the school system, it involves the department, and, and making sure that there is um, a much better use of information from all of those systems so that there's appropriate actions are being taken. But I think it's going to be critically important that all of those affected by the recommendations are held accountable for implementing changes to prevent any future tragedy like this. So you both mentioned Opega, and that's what we actually want to get into next. So the deaths of these two girls, you know, Kendall Chick and Marissa Kennedy, that actually spawned an investigative into Child Protective Services by Maine's Watchdog Agency. But those results so far have actually offered few details to the people in a position to make change, in this case, the Government Oversight Committee. So we'll discuss that in one moment. We have one more sound to roll for you first. Well, I think they're mostly generic. But where children have actually been murdered, um, the confidentiality rights of the parent or the, or the caretakers should be put aside in, in deference to the public's right to know. And that's part of the frustrating part. You, you, know, you definitely feel like you want to share and satisfy you know, what is a real desire to understand what went on here. We have to look at it, these two little girls that were killed. And uh, to sit here and not be more aggressive, uh, and I understand all the restrictions we're under, but to be, not be more aggressive in, in helping those kids who are being abused. And you know, we are talking about these people who are in a position to make change. The Government Oversight Committee, you know, Senator Diamond, Senator Cates, and the rest of them, those are the people, and they are frustrated by a lack of information in this report. How do you respond to that? Anyone? Well, it's, it's a preliminary report. First, OPEG is still doing its work. They only had a couple of short months to start on this work, and I know that it involves voluminous data, voluminous records from a lot of different sources. Um, and so we're trying to balance the, the, criminal, the process of the criminal case and the discovery in the criminal case with OPEGA's very necessary, very vital investigation and the, ultimately reporting to the The OPEGA report that was put out, which, which, which I took a look at, appeared to me to be a big nothing burger. There were very few details about any, any, of, any of the information pertaining to this case that could be helpful to the public in pr protecting other kids. And again, you know, the grandfather of one of these girls said he doesn't want a witch hunt. Nobody wants a witch hunt. That's, that's, not, that's not helpful. What, every, what everybody up here on this panel and everybody who works in the system wants is to make sure that what happened to these little girls doesn't happen to other kids. We all want so, that, obviously. So, you know, the, 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 what really troubles me is that the issue of confidentiality is too often portrayed as a zero-sum game. Either you protect the integrity of an ongoing criminal investigation and the due process rights of the defendants, which is an extremely important um, factor to, to consider, or you disclose information that can um, initiate improvements in the child welfare system and protect other kids. That's not, that's not a dichotomy that's meaningful. You have to do both. And really, both the criminal justice system and the child welfare system are meant to protect the public safety. So for example, um, some of the data that's required to be disclosed on child fatalities has very little to do with the perpetrator of the violence. It's much more interested in what happened in this case before the act um, occurred that caused the child's death. What are the previous contacts with CPS? What were the services that were initiated? How many times did somebody reach out for help before? Some of that information might, in fact, be pertinent to the criminal case, but it's, but it's not directly related to, to the defense of that criminal, of, of the, of the um, defendant. And so you have to balance the public interest what if that child who was killed has a sibling who's still in danger? For goodness siblings. sake, how do you... There siblings involved in both of these cases. You know that, right? I, I, no, I, I don't know. There I don't are know. other children involved in their privacy So how do you balance? Are at stake here. So what's That's the exactly right place what, to balance? That is exactly what the court just did about a month ago when there was a lawsuit to require the disclosure of a lot of those records. And the court found that there was not an automatic right of disclosure, not an automatic right of uh, access to that information. At this time, eventually there will be much more information disclosed. But right now, OPEGA is doing its job. OPEGA has as much lawful access as it can possibly have to all available records. And it's a 
it's going to be a thoughtful time state time taking pro uh, process but you I know I just want to stress that OPEGA investigations often are 12 months 24 months long and they have done an incredible job over their uh, history of being in place to make sure that they're not rushing to judgment and and they were just assigned this investigation right and it, nobody's blaming OPEGA well but no but I think you're drawing conclusions about a preliminary report that was never intended to inform the broad level of review comprehensive review they do have broad authority to have access to information and that will be part of their comprehensive report. I think we just need to be careful that we don't draw conclusions uh, about this preliminary report. They're, they are going to come back with a far more comprehensive report after they've conducted a thorough investigation. And they will not be the only ones re reviewing. So you are confident that there will be you know, a report that the public gets to see that really does answer some questions so the public can do what it needs to do. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. I, I, I believe the public has that right, ultimately. It's hard to be patient to wait for that information. But are I we able we to be to patient be. when children's lives are at stake? Four to eight children die every day across the country from abuse and neglect. So it's very, it is very difficult to be patient and to and to remember that confidentiality laws were intended to protect victims and vulnerable people. Confidentiality laws were not intended to protect systems. Okay, and so it's really important. FERPA, FERPA has nothing to do with being victims. It's yeah. very important to remember the intended beneficiaries of confidentiality laws and the, and the, the, the intended, those who were supposed to be protected by confidentiality and those who might be taking advantage of loopholes in confidentiality in order to shield systems from accountability. I, I want to be clear, and obviously I'm not at the department anymore, but the department, I'm sure, is taking actions today based upon issues they've identified, concerns that have been raised. So they're not standing still out waiting for OPEGA's report. OPEGA's report will absolutely help to inform and continue to support improvements, but I'm certain the department, I'm certain law enforcement, anyone who has had some exposure to, experience with, or involvement with this case are already looking at, reflecting on, and taking action to address concerns that have been identified. Right, so changes are already happening before that information necessarily comes into public light. I um, think the initial report said that, in fact. It did. Yeah. Mr. I think it's really, really important that at the end of the process, however long it takes, is that the public has confidence in the systems in place. Because if mm -hmm. the public doesn't have confidence, they're less likely to report because what's the use? I don't believe they're going to do anything good with it. I don't mm -hmm. trust what they're going to do. So it's really, really important that the people of Maine believe in the systems that we have that are designed to protect children mm -hmm. if the system is going to work well. And if they don't, then even if we have the best system, the people that are the eyes and ears, school teachers, for example, they see children all the time. When I was supervising, you know, I reminded the caseworkers that they go in in a high stress situation um, and they form judgments about a family system. School teachers get to see children every single mm. day and they get to see those little changes in behavior. A normally hyper child right. is a normally hyper child, but if I'm a caseworker and I'm investigating something, it's really easy for me to come in with a bias and when I see hyper child, I don't see the normal, within the normal range, I don't see that necessarily within that context. So people that are the neighbors, the relatives, the school teachers, they're the ones that are going to be in the best position to ensure children are safe. And the department is there to help support them in doing that. And there has to be a trust on both sides to make that happen.